Hello everybody, my name is Shankarji. Now we'll be studying chapter 12. Buildings, paintings and books. We'll start with the iron pillar. We all might have heard about the famous iron pillar which is located near the Kutub Pinar, New Delhi. We all know uh, the Kutub Pinar is the India's tallest up, which is around uh, 72 meters in height. So the iron pillar is approximately one tenth the height of the Kutub Minar, 7.2 meters high. And uh, the iron pillar weighs more than 3 tons, I mean approximately more than 3000 kilograms. And uh, it was built more than 1500 years ago. Historians found the inscription mentioned on the iron pillar. So in the inscription, uh, King Chandra was mentioned and he probably belonged to the Gupta dynasty. So most probably this Chandra ruler might have uh, uh, built the iron pillar. The, the fascinating part regarding the iron pillar is that it is rust free and scientists and historians are really baffled, they are puzzled, they are uh, amazed that the iron pillar is completely rust free uh, unlike other iron if you keep an iron piece in the open for uh, six months down the line the the shine of the iron will fade away and it will become rust scientists and historians are still studying about that even today this is one of the example of the miracles of ancient constructions like over 1500 years ago in an amazing way they have built all these constructions which is a great wonder even in modern day architecture uh, the Kutub Minar is named after Kutubuddin Aibak who uh, started started building the Kutub Minar but however he was unable to complete it. It was completed by Iltut Mish later on. So that's why to honor Kutubuddin Aibak it is named as the Kutub Minar and the iron pillar was built by the Gupta dynasty. However it is still within that Kutub Minar campus area. So the archaeological survey of India has marked those areas where, where the iron pillar is. I mean it's it's all well protected because it's a, it's a world heritage site. So a lot of tourists come and visit the Kutub Minar, the iron pillar every day on a regular basis. Now we'll take a look at buildings in brick and stone. The craftsperson who built these buildings were highly skilled. They worked very hard. So for example, these craftspersons, they built the stupas. The word stupa means it's a mound, it's something like a megalith. So there are several kinds of stupas, for example, round stupas, tall stupas, big stupas, small stupas. All these stupas, they have common features. All of them have a small box known as the relic casket, which is placed at the center or heart of the stupa. So the stupas is not like a burial site. Usually this uh, relic casket contained bodily remains of the Buddha or his followers or things which they used or sometimes it also contained precious stones and coins. Finally above all this a big a grand dome was built so that we know that it's a stupa, uh, it's a holy religious memorial site and devotees, even monks, even kings, a lot of Buddhist monks, even tourists uh, visit many of these stupas and uh, pay their homages and respect to them. And uh, there was also a path which was laid around uh, the stupas known as the Pradakshina Patha so that the devotees and the people who are paying their homages to the holy persons they can circumambulate around the stupa like that means go around and round as long as they wish to offer their homages and then uh, the, these stupas were also surrounded by railings the railings and gateways are elaborately decorated with sculpture even today they are found in a very good condition for example, the Sanchi stupa is still there, it's not much damage has been done even over centuries. But there was another stupa known as the Amaravati stupa which no longer exists because it has been damaged over the course of time. So there are many other stupas which, is, which are still there but some of the stupas have been destroyed over the period of time unfortunately. Apart from stupas, artificial caves were hollowed out of rock with painted walls and sculptures. During the same time, a lot of Hindu temples were being built during this period with Garbhagriha. Garbhagriha is the most uh, important part of the temple which is also known as the Sanctum Sanctorum where the main idol of the temple it might be Lord Shiva, it might be Lord Vishnu the main deity was placed that's known as the Garbhagriha also we call it as Sanctum Sanctorum in English the most important part and the most holiest part of the temple the Hindu priests used to perform rituals and offer worship pay their homages to the deities to which they worship and they also offered uh, prasad uh, in the form of food or some uh, plant remaining or it can be a flower to the devotees and uh, to show their respect to the deities uh, whom they are offering their worships. Both Hinduism and Buddhism were being developed in parallel pathways during this time period. So for example, uh, in a place called uh, Bhitargaon, in Bhitargaon, 
the Shikara Tower was built on top of the Garbagriha. Like what do you mean by the Shikara Tower? The Garbagriha, like the tower which is which which is above the, the Santum Sanctorum known as the Garbagriha that is known as the Shikara Tower. In South India, it's also known as the Gopuram, the Gopuram Tower because if you look at the Hindu temples, the South Indian temples, uh, there will be a main Gopuram on the top of the Sanctum Sanctorum. The Shikara Tower required a very a lot of careful planning. Uh, apart from this, they also had an assembly hall in, in front of the uh, Gopuram or the Shikara Tower known as the Mandapa where a lot of people could be assembled and uh, celebrate a function or a ritual. For example, uh, Mamalapuram, Mamalipuram was the old name. Now its uh, modern name is Mamalapuram, Aihole. They have wonderful rock art and cave paintings which are being visited by tourists, uh, historians and archaeologists worldwide even now today. Now we'll take a look at how were these stupas and temples built. First of all, these stupas and temples were built in several stages. The, the ruler, the king or the priest, they selected, they selected a location they selected a deity, they selected uh, all these uh, important uh, holy uh, aspects and uh, a place was chosen and the amount of money required, the budget, everything they planned. So mainly there were four stages. First the planning stage, then uh, the like selection of stones, transporting the stones, shaping and carving them and placing them, placing the stones and the rocks at their correct positions. And then like I said, it was very expensive, it was not easy, it was very hard to build all these stupas and temples and uh, even other people donated, apart from the kings and the rulers, a lot of people, all the people were welcome to give their own uh, contribution donations, even travelers, even monks. And then uh, we'll take a look at paintings. <coughs> they were, I mean, apart from these rock art sculptures, wonderful rock paintings were also found in many of the caves. So the most famous caves which, uh, in which these rock paintings were found are the Ajanta and the Elora caves where exquisite rock art, sculptures and rock paintings were found and they were created more than 1500 years ago. Nobody exactly knows who exactly created these art but most probably they were Buddhist monks who spent some time doing these rock caves meditating in the path of their moksha or nirvana. So in the meantime, they might have done some art in those caves and we have those inscriptions even now. So it's a world heritage site which, uh, which even uh, tourists from worldwide visit uh, Ajanta and Elora caves on a regular basis. And uh, so we took a look at paintings, Ajanta and Elora caves. Now we'll take a look at the world of books. So the world of books, it is just that apart from this buildings, stupas, temples, rock art, paintings, a lot of books were also being written in various languages during this time. For example, the Silapadigaram, a famous Tamil epic, was composed by a poet named Ilango approximately 1800 years ago. This uh, epic, this Tamil epic, the Silapadigaram, the, the Silapadigaram is a story of uh, Kovalan, uh, Kannagi and Madhavi. So Kovalan uh, left his wife because he fell in love with the courtesan Madhavi and uh, they lived in the city of Pumpuha, a, a seaport on the southeastern side of India. Later on Kovalan and Kannagi left Pumpuha and went to Madurai where he was wrongly accused of theft by the king and uh, he was wrongly put to death. And then uh, Kannagi cursed the entire kingdom and uh, destroyed Madurai. So in this way, Kannagi got uh, justice uh, for her husband and for herself. Then we take a look at uh, the Mani Meghalai. One more uh, uh, composition, the Tamil epic was composed during this time. So the Mani Meghalai was composed by Satanar approximately 1400 years ago. Something like the continuation of the Silapadigal. Uh, these compositions were very beautiful. It's truly a great uh, literary marvel. People who study languages, they are really amazed at the uh, elaborate uh, grammar and uh, the literary techniques which they use to compose these great compositions. And then in the meantime, the Meghaduta was composed in Sanskrit by Kalidasa during this time. And then uh, we'll take a look at uh, recording and preserving stories. For example, we all know about uh, the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Vedas, the Puranas, etc. So apart from the word of mouth, these 
uh, great religious books had to be preserved in a written form as well and a lot of people painstakingly wrote these holy religious scriptures on various manuscripts and preserved them carefully as much as possible so even now we have this ancient manuscripts in various places like we have a great museum in Pune where we can still find the ancient Vedas which was originally written so not only the Pune museum there were other areas where these manuscripts were found but however unfortunately during the course of thousands of years many of these manuscripts were destroyed historians have found at least some original manuscripts even now and they are carefully preserved by the government of India so we, we took a look at the preservation of the various holy books in the form of manuscripts and then uh, we'll take a look at uh, stories told by ordinary people like we discussed in the earlier classes the stories told by the ordinary people they were known as the Jatakas the Jataka tales or the Jatakas like the stories which were told by the word of mouth and it was being recorded by the people so one of the famous Jatakas was the Panchatantra the Panchatantra was composed by the famous Hindi poet and author Vishnu Sharma it was like a moral stories like it was very pictorial simple stories based on interaction between animals like human beings in a very funny way stories which which induce some moral sense in human beings so the Panchatantra can be compared to Aesop's fables because Aesop was a great slave in the ancient Greece he also composed something like this moral stories and people learned a lot from these Panchatantra tales so they were very simple and they were very easily understood by the people and very easily accepted and loved by the people especially the kids love them even today and then uh, these Panchatantra stories were even shown in the railings of stupas and caves even uh, many of these stories are found in the caves of Ajanta and Elora what a fascinating thing so for example the story of the monkey king it's a very famous story so even uh, even this story and many other stories are found in these various rock art and various uh, inscriptions now we'll take a look at writing books on science because a lot of religious books were being written during this period apart from that few people also wrote some various uh, very important books regarding science and mathematics i would say the famous indian mathematician and scientist aryabhatta he wrote in sanskrit aryabhatyam regarding various science and mathematics topics so uh, some of the important topics which he mentions in aryabhatyam is Aryabhata explained that day and night is caused by the rotation of the earth on its axis that's why the day and night are caused he also gave scientific explanation for eclipses solar eclipses for lunar eclipses he also calculated the circumference of the circle c is equal to 2 pi r the formula which we use so he showed his mathematical proof regarding this calculation and during this time zero was invented approximately 1500 years ago in india so uh, we Indians also showed uh, how to operate on zero using the various mathematical operations and uh, it spread throughout the whole world because before that the, the world was using just numbers not zero and then during this time elsewhere paper was invented in China about 1900 years ago because we all need paper to write to read to uh, for printing everything so now we'll take a look at some important dates the beginning of stupa building approximately 2300 years ago then amaravati which is not there which is there in ruins nowadays but modern day amaravati is being still uh, constructed so amaravati existed approximately 2000 years ago which was a great uh, city and a great power center during ancient times and kalidasa lived around 1600 years ago and then the iron pillar temple at Bhitargaon, paintings at Ajanta, Aryabhatta about uh, 1500 years ago and then uh, the, the construction of Durga temples all over India started approximately 1400 years ago we covered a lot of uh, interesting topics so you can add further points to the existing knowledge and if you have any doubts or suggestions please let us know in the comment section below thank you so much have a great day